The base of the skull, if it gets fractured, it's really, really dangerous. It's quite hard to fracture the base of the skull. It's usually the result of very, very high energy trauma, such as high speed motor vehicle collisions or one person uh, delivering a heavy blow, very, very heavy blow to somebody else's head. But down here, there are a lot of very important structures. So we've looked at the bones of the skull before, and we've looked at the foramina of the skull. The aim of this session is to run through the anatomy of the base of the skull, so you can think about clues that might give you a hint that the basal skull has been fractured, and then what you should worry about, okay? The foramen magnum is the big hole, and through here, past the, uh, the, the brain stem becoming the spinal cord, so that's an important structure. But don't forget, through here are also passing the vertebral arteries, uh, which are supplying blood to the brain. Uh, and if we look at this skull, we can see that the foramen magnum is part of the occipital bone. On either side of foramen magnum, we see these larger lumps of bone. These are the occipital condyles. A condyle is a knuckle. So these are the bony knuckles uh, which the skull then sits upon when it articulates with the, the spine, with the vertebral column. So the occipital condyles are up here. So there's a lot of load passing through there and a lot of muscles and ligaments are involved. Um, the occipital condyles have a hole in them, which is the hypoglossal canal through which the hypoglossal nerve passes, cranial nerve 12. It's on its way to the tongue. It's going to innervate almost all of the muscles of the tongue. So you can imagine that a fracture here risks compressing or damaging something like the hypoglossal nerve, which would affect tongue motor function. All right, so we're linking all this stuff together to work out what's going on in somebody's head. The foramen magnum, occipital condyles, hypoglossal canals are all parts of the occipital bone. Because we're thinking about bone fractures, so we should think about which bones things are in, right? That's part, that's part of my sneaky aim here, more cranial nerves and uh, what's in what bone. So the occipital bone. Now this here is the temporal bone. All right, this is what the temporal bone, there's one on either side, a left one and a right one, that was, that's what that looks like from an inferior perspective. And the most notable feature are these pointy styloid processes. There's only one because this one's broken off because when you drop bones, when you drop skulls in the lab, the first thing that breaks off is usually the styloid process. The styloid process, like most bony processes, is an attachment site for a number of ligaments and muscles which support other structures in the neck. For example, the stylohyoid muscle runs to the hyoid bone, so it's supporting the structures of the larynx. So that's the styloid process there. And then next to it, this is the mastoid process. The mastoid process is posterior to the ear. The mastoid process is also part of the temporal bone. The mastoid process has a number of air cells inside it. Um, it's also an attachment site for other structures. For example, the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, and right next to it, we have the external auditory meatus or the ear canal. So uh, one of the things you want to look out for uh, with a basal skull fracture is there is cerebrospinal fluid inside the cranial cavity. The brain is floating in it. If a clear liquid is leaking from an ear or from the nose, that liquid might be cerebrospinal fluid. And if it is, that's telling you that something is fractured here 
and the meninges that are holding it all in have also torn and that is leaking out. That is a bad thing, but a strong sign that one of the bones of the base of the skull has been fractured. Um, so the ear canal is one to look out for, right? Also around here, so mastoid process, styloid process, and in between the two, there is a stylomastoid foramen. And out from there comes the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, or it's, it's branch that supplies the muscles of facial expression. So damage here could crush that nerve and paralyze the muscles of facial expression on that side of the face. So that comes out there. And again, we're still in the temporal bone. And if we move a little bit medially again, there's another hole there. And you can see that that hole is actually a, it's a, it's a, it's a hole, it's a gap between the occipital bone and the temporal bone. That's the jugular foramen. Out from the jugular foramen, we find the internal jugular vein draining much of the blood from the cranial cavity and also cranial nerves nine, 10 and 11. Now cranial nerve 11, the accessory nerve, it innervates trapezius. So you can shrug your shoulders. Um, 10, the vagus nerve, well that innervates a lot of things, but remember that it innervates the larynx, right? Uh, and the um, glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9, is sensory from the back of the, larynx, uh, back of the pharynx, right? And the posterior tongue. So if somebody, um, has weakness, shrugging the shoulder on one side, has um, a loss of a gag reflex or no sensation of numbness from the posterior third of the tongue, and has difficulty speaking, a hoarse voice. All of those nerves could have been damaged, crushed by something, either a bone fracture or a mass, a tumor might have formed down here, that's compressing those nerves. All of these things are packed together in a very tight space. And then right next to that, where the pipe cleaner is going there, that's the carotid canal. So in there passes the internal carotid artery, a really important blood vessel supplying blood to the brain, and with it, sympathetic nerves from the chest are passing up here into the cranial cavity. So fractures here could damage that blood vessel, could cause intracranial bleeding, um, could damage the sympathetic nerves that are going into the cranial cavity. So remember that um, in the eye, the sympathetic nerves cause the eyes to open widely and the pupils to dilate. So a loss of sympathetic innervation to the muscles inside the eye, for example, would mean that whilst parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves work in opposition in both eyes to control the diameter of the pupil, letting the right amount of light in. If the sympathetic innervation to one side is lost, then the pupil on one side will be a different diameter to the other side. Um, the parasympathetic innervation will win and shrink the pupil a little bit. So are the pupils the same size on both sides? Of course, you'd also be shining a light in each eye and seeing if each eye, if both eyes react to um, bright light in one eye or the other. Um, we'll come on to that later, that's something a little bit different. Um, but again, that carotid canal is in the temporal bone. Um, now between, all right, so we've got like a triangular hole in here. That is actually a cartilaginous joint between the temporal bone, the occipital bone, and the sphenoid bone there in, in red. And for, this is foramen lacerum. So in life, this is a connected tissue joint, a cartilage joint holding those bones together. A few tiny structures pass through it. So it's not of major concern to us. But that joint between these three bones, this region, that is interesting, isn't it? Because joints can be weaker than bones. Um, by the way, we talked about the, uh, the vertebral arteries going in here. So on the other side of the bones there, inside the cranial cavity, we would find the basilar artery on the opposite side to the bones here. So a fracture here would risk damage to the basilar artery on the other side, which is supplying blood to the brain and importantly to the brain stem. So occipital bone, temporal bone, sphenoid bone. Now within the sphenoid bone, there is an oval hole and next to it, a tiny little hole 
as if made by a thorn. Um, this is foramen spinosum and foramen ovale. Through foramen spinosum past the middle meningeal artery and the middle meningeal vein. Uh, the middle meningeal artery, if torn inside the cranial cavity, is a strong contender for um, epidural, extradural hematoma, arterial bleed between the dura mater and the bones of the cranial cavity. So that's passing through there. Through the oval, through foramen ovale, um, passes the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. That's the major structure passing through there. The, the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, CNV3, if you like, will carry sensory innervation from the low face and also is motor to the muscles of mastication. So as I said earlier, a fracture here um, could damage compress, paralyze the facial nerve branch that innervates the muscles of facial expression, the muscles of mastication, chewing, that bit would still work, but you wouldn't be able to keep your lips closed and your cheek would blow out, you know, you wouldn't be able to, anyway. <clears throat> Whereas if the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve was injured, because this bone was fractured here, then the muscles of mastication on that side would be weak and there would be numbness down here. Um, so those are the two major holes. And then we see these wings. So these wings are the pterygoid plates. There are various muscle attachments here. This is all sphenoid bone. We see this, is it orange? Yeah, this orange midline bone. This is Voma. And then we get to the palate where we have the palatine bones of the palate and the maxilla. I'm sure the face also gets trauma, but that's slightly different. And in terms of the nose, if we're thinking about cerebrospinal fluid leaking through the nose, then we're thinking about a fracture to the ethmoid bone. And for that, we need to look at the floor of the cranial cavity from inside, and we'll probably save that for another day. So, a base of skull fracture or a basilar skull fracture can injure these bones down here and damage the many structures, the many very important structures that are also down here. What you should look out for are, uh, is, is blood collecting around the eyes, panda eyes or raccoon eyes, I think it varies depending upon which, whether you're in North America or Europe, I'm not sure. Um, so blood, like black eyes, too, like blood collecting around the eyes, bruising around the eyes without obvious trauma to the face. The injury is here, the bruising collects here. Also, you may see blood collecting around the mastoid process, so bruising here. You might see, as I said, cerebrospinal fluid leaking from the nose or the ear. And then you need to look out for those cranial nerve signs because you're thinking about the cranial nerves, particularly the low cranial nerves, 9, 10, 11, 12 that we mentioned down here because they're leaving the skull low down so they might be damaged. But there's also the cranial nerve 8, which goes to the ear, which is nearby. That could be damaged, so a loss of balance, loss of hearing, that sort of thing. Oh, and I said I'd talk about the oculomotor nerve, didn't I? And I'm going to go back in here another day, but the oculomotor nerve runs across the floor of the cranial cavity. So a basilar skull fracture could also damage the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3, which, which you'll then see oculomotor nerve signs in the eye, which is, you know, a change in the position of the pupil and dosis and go and look, I'm sure I've done it. I must've done a video about cranial nerve three, right? The oculomotor nerve, cause it's, it's a biggie. And then you need to worry about the blood vessels. You need to worry about the vertebral arteries, the internal carotid arteries, the internal jugular vein. You need to worry about uh, bleeding intracranially, you need to worry about ischemia, you need to worry about clots leaving these blood vessels after the trauma, you know, after clots have formed and passing into um, important structures inside the cranial cavity, bits of the brain and that sort of thing. Um, and then you need to worry about uh, meningitis, infection in here. It's, it's a really, really dangerous, bad thing. Um, but this is why your anatomy of this region is so important because you can apply all this um, to the patient. Okay, but there you go. That's a run through the anatomy of the base of the skull
in relation to the individual bones, what passes through them, and uh, basilar skull fractures. Oh, by the way, there's a lot of tissues down here, so a number of different types of tumours can also form from the number of tissues down here, and a tumour forming a mass can also uh, compress the structures we've talked about and give you those, those signs and symptoms that we mentioned. All right, the skull, it's great. Um, see you next week. <laughs>